Um, before we get into the, the business at hand, can I invite everyone to stand? Because I understand that some of you are quite cold. And some of you went to Sembayang. Uh, so can you all please stand, okay? Look around. If there's someone that you have not spoken to, wave to them. Yeah, got to wave to everyone because there's a chance that you haven't spoken to 90% of the people in the hall. Okay, thank you very much. Please be seated. Um, as the actually, I di didn't want to use the word moderator because it sounds as if I'm going to moderate people fighting. Um, facilitator would have been actually what I would have liked. I came prepared, not so many questions, but it's all in a file. Um, now, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Tansri Michael Yo and KSI for uh, inviting me to be the moderator for this uh, session. Um, for the speakers, you have exactly 4 minutes 35 seconds to speak during the first round. The bell will ring at 4 minutes, at 4 minutes 30 seconds, and then you have 5 seconds to wrap up. <laughs> um, so the, the first round is on the personal experience in APBGM SDG. So I'd like to invite um, first YB Maria Chin. You started as the first chair and now the deputy chair, and you have been approaching your work as an MP in PJ from an SDG perspective. Please share your reflections. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, that's the thing about uh, being the last sessions here. Uh, I think that um, the sustainable development goals have actually been part and parcel of the programs that I run at um, Petaling Jaya as a member of parliament. So when um, the all-party parliamentary group actually introduced the uh, SDGs to us, we were pretty happy. I have a volunteer of about uh, 60 of them. So uh, we actually form groups to uh, discuss with the communities how do we actually ensure that uh, some of the goals are actually achieved. So we actually chose a few goals um, on hunger, on poverty, on health, um, on education, and also on um, building coalitions, yeah, partnerships. So those were the key things that uh, we did for the SDG under the APPGM project. And uh, what I find is that um, it gives us a focus, it gives us a standard to go by, and also it also um, helps us to have some form of a measure of the outcomes, what we want to achieve, and uh, whether at the end of the day we actually achieve it. So um, to, to just give an example, uh, we have a project on um, uh, cookies for cost that is actually to increase the uh, economic empowerment to try to bring about uh, gender equality into the uh, communities and that actually uh, brought up quite a lot of challenges because we started to understand that the women not only just need job but they also need child care facilities because they had to actually take care of the children as well as do their business, as well as trying to sell their business, as well as taking care of the families and so forth. So um, even when we actually introduced a small project on economic empowerment, we had to tackle even more uh, problems of uh, employment, child care, even the husband's uh, employment because the husband uh, at that time during the MCO lost the job or had some of their uh, salaries halved. So these were the thing, the challenges that we had and um, we find it very interesting that SDG actually helped to guide us. So thank you. Can you ring the bell? Just ring the bell. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm trying to be as serious as possible. Eh? Um, uh, next, we have YB William. Um, YB, I was told that you were the first member of parliament to invite the Malaysian CSO SDG Alliance in 2016 
to share with opposition MPs on SDGs. And Dr. Dennison and Dr. Lin came to Parliament to share with the MPs. Why did you consider SDGs as an MP? Thank you very much. Before I invited Dr. Dennison, Dato Dennison and Dr. Lin, I actually had gone to see them at a discussion on the transition from the MDG to the SDG. And as we all know, it all derives from Amatia Sen's capability approach. And as an MP, we are dealing with poverty as a daily issue. And we know that poverty cannot be measured on a single measurement of per capita or GNP or $980 as the guideline. And for instance, the report that was given at that time, we are talking about 2016, is that the Malaysian government has eradicated poverty. There are only pockets of it left. It's only 0.4%. 0.4% comes up to 25,000 households. I thought all the 25,000 households are in Slayang. <laughs> so I said, that's why I've got to go and find Dr. Dennison and Dr. Dennison and Dr. Lin. What can we do? Because we know that poverty is multidimensional. And that when there is deprivation, there is poverty. Not necessarily that it has to be that they are earning less than $980. And to get them out of poverty, compensating them by giving them a monthly welfare check of 300 is not going to solve the problem. If what they need is education, then the solution is not giving them a subsidy, but to give them the training that they can get out of poverty. And that is what the SDG is all about, that you are looking at eradication of poverty, SDG 1, but it's connected with all the other 17 goals. You have to look at it from a holistic approach. And that's why I went to see, at that time, the CSO Alliance or the SDG. And I realized that if the MPs can adopt the SDGs in our daily operations as MPs, then we can have the political voice and a public will to ensure that our Malaysian government will be able to do a complete reform, not piecemeal, not in a way of a silo, but using the complete comprehensive SDGs as the base. So that is why I asked the CSO Alliance to brief the MPs, and our reaction at that time was, Dr. Dennison, I think you are talking to the wrong group. We are the opposition. <laughs> Fortunately, a, a few months later, we were not. But unfortunately, we are, we are opposition again. <laughs> but I think the message now is that with an uh, all-parliament group, it doesn't really matter. We have now been able to get first 10 MPs, but now we are going to get 20 more and that's across the, across the board. So it's all political parties. We don't need to worry about whether we are opposition or government. I think working together, we realize that this is how we are going to achieve our target, that it is not a single measurement, but to be able to pinpoint the various deprivation that each person may have in order for that person to be given the capabilities to live the flourishing life that everyone is entitled to. Thank you. I think this is the first time I see um, politicians actually speaking very short time. You know, I'm a bit worried. Uh, next, we have Dr. Lin. She was whispering to me, good, I have extra time. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Lin, now what, uh, you played an active role in the earlier Millennium Development Goals and now in the Sustainable Development Goals also. What is your interest 
motivation and role in the APPGM SDG? Dr. Lin. Yeah, I, I think there is endless things to be done. And uh, I think there's uh, not enough of us to try to uh, do as much as possible to achieve uh, what the MDG has not yet uh, has not achieved and what the SDG has is aspiring to achieve. And um, today we're talking about the localizing of the uh, SDGs. And as you know, the, S, the APPGM uh, SDG was set up to localize SDGs in parliamentary constituencies. Uh, our research team works with the YB's office, government of agencies, NGOs, and communities to identify the uh, issues and challenges faced by each constituency during field visits and focus groups discussions. And upon prioritizing the uh, issues, the solution projects are designed to address them within the allocation of uh, 120,000 which has been allocated for each constituency. Uh, calls for proposals are then made to interested and competing, competent parties to submit the uh, proposed solutions. And the APPG seeks to maximize the contribution from the expertise, experience, dedication, and commitment of all related organizations to assist the communities on the ground. Uh, proposals are then reviewed by the Solutions Committee, which emphasizes the criteria of effectiveness, sustainability, recoverability, and uh, scalability. Uh, the suitability and capacity of the project proponents are also assessed. The reviewed projects are then endorsed by the respective MPs before being prepared, uh, presented to the APPG EXCO for final approval. And our partners include city, municipal, and district councils, tanking tanks, universities, CSOs, and also private firms. And uh, in preparation for the implementation of the solution projects, we also carry out capacity building sessions for government agencies, NGOs, and communities to let them understand what the SDGs are, understand the principles, how they are relevant to them in their work and in their daily lives, so that they will know what we are doing and uh, work together to achieve uh, what we set up to do. And the uh, 34 projects which we are implementing in the 10 constituencies are very wide ranging to address the diverse local issues that have been prioritized. They are aimed at uh, addressing the well being and income of the B40 groups, including women, youth who are unemployed or retrenched, Orang Asli, Orang Asal, who lack access to economic opportunities, and the general community, including squatters who lack access to social welfare benefits, infrastructure, and services. They cover many sectors and are cross-cutting in nature. They include health and wellness, education, waste management, technical skills training, entrepreneurial development, income generating projects, such as organic farming, mushroom cultivation, aquaculture, bakery, craft making, skills training, micro business management, and digital marketing, ecotourism, and uh, national unity and partnership, and community development. Uh, shall I conclude? Continue, okay. And the uh, project implementers are required to submit monthly progress reports, as well as feedback from the participants. And so far, feedback has been very positive with the activities completed and objectives achieved so And many NGOs, local op communities, and even government agencies have been energized to make improvements to further overcome local issues that are addressed by the solutions projects. 
And this clearly shows that the bottom-up approach used to design and implement projects to address the specific needs of the community is effective in achieving the SDGs. It is to be noted that many of the projects cover grounds that are under the purview and responsibility of government agencies, but they did, do not seem to have effectively addressed and met the needs of the local communities. As such, it is important to review public development policies and service delivery modes, as well as the performance of frontline agencies and to find ways for, the improve, for their improvement. Another necessary requirement is to enhance the effectiveness of projects for the grassroots communities is connectivity, which will help them, which is uh, necessary for the new normal in education, work and business. And due to the efforts and achievement made in 2020, there has been good uptake by MPs for the additional 20 constituencies for 2021. Uh, the uh, APPG program demonstrates the power of bottom-up approach that is used in the localizing of the SDGs. The process of issue mapping and prioritization has led to the design of solution projects to address the specific challenges as there is no one size fit all solutions for addressing problems on the ground. It enables the leapfrogging from traditional businesses to high-tech e-commerce, provides valuable transformation for the local communities to catch up and to create a more level playing field. It is a good approach to empower the local community and to achieve the Agenda 2030, and it should be stepped up in order to leave no one behind. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lin. Um, we will now go to uh, Inchi Alizan Mahadi. Uh, can I say ISIS? Okay, uh, Inche Alizan is from ISIS, not the one that chops people's hair, but he's from the good ISIS, ISIS Malaysia. Um, Alizan, you were part of the readiness report for SDGs in 2015, and now with the con consultant team preparing the VNR 2021. What's motivating you over these years, and what is your current role? Okay, thank you, Anthony. I think I'll give my perspective as a researcher, as, as that is my uh, occupation. So, from a researcher point of view, our responsibility, our mandate is really to firstly generate knowledge, but we have to move beyond generating knowledge and utilize that knowledge for problem solving in real world, real world situations. So when the SDGs were adopted in 2015, it really gave an opportunity um, to really translate the research into resolving some of the greatest challenges that we face in the world. And this is where um, I have uh, always believed that the SDGs can be used as a tool for, uh, for this purpose for a few reasons. Firstly, before the SDGs were, were adopted in 2015, as mentioned before, I think by YB William, that you know, this concept of um, sustainable development or development being holistic. When we talk about sustainable development, you know, pre-2015, it's often very conceptual. It's often very, um, you know, we talk about uh, addressing social, economic issues, environmental issues in an integrated manner, etc. But often it's more confined to um, the ivory tower, essentially. So when the SDGs um, was adopted, firstly, it provided a tool to really interpret the SDGs in practical terms. And this is where I think um, the first, um, I would say, um, way to utilize the SDGs is provided a framework for all countries to follow in, in implementing sustainable development. Uh, secondly, I think though we do have to, to, to move beyond the agenda setting or the interpretation of sustainable development definition and here, um, you know, to coordinate such a, such a complex issue, we need the SDGs to inform policy. 
And in this context, this is where you mentioned I've worked in a various uh, policy research um, activities related to SDGs, is that we have to understand the Sustainable Development Goals is voluntary in nature. And therefore, you need deliberate actions. You need, uh, you need to add context into the SDGs um, to, to implement it. And therefore, I think, again, researchers play an important role uh, and play an important responsibility to provide that domestic context, that local context, to really understand the implementation of the SDGs. And finally, I think, um, thirdly, that probably one of the most important things of the SDGs um, that people sometimes don't realize when they have too fixed with the goals themselves is that the SDGs provide a platform um, to, to really just maybe bring people together for partnership, for things like even today, for discursive elements. Um, I think here um, today for this session, we're speaking about the all-party parliamentary group on SDGs, as Dr. Lin has, has also brought up. And this would not have been possible without the SDGs. So this is SDGs, you can see this from an institutional point of view or from a partnership point of view. It, can, it provides that space to bring people together. So I think, you know, um, when you talk about, you asked me also what my current role is. So I'm the lead researcher for the APPGM SDG. So this is an interesting experiment as a researcher where we use this, what was, again, as I said, pre-2015, perhaps a more abstract concept to many people. We really look to bring this concept of sustainable development to where it matters, and this is the local level. So we work with uh, YBs, uh, parliamentarians. We, we also work with local stakeholders, local leaders, and they themselves will identify what the issues that they are face, facing on the ground, um, and also the solutions as well. So in that context, I think, um, you know, if, if I can just summarize um, my, my points here is that firstly, in the first instance, the SDGs itself started to interpret in a more concrete terms what this concept of sustainable development is. Secondly, though, we have to understand the SDGs won't implement by itself. So it allowed for certain actors, uh, policy researchers, policy advocates to really inform policy on what we can do based on the context of the SDGs. And finally, to really influence implementation, the SDGs requires the partnerships across various stakeholders. And again, the SDGs provide um, that space for, for discussion on SDGs. I'll stop there. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Alizan. Um, I'll quickly um, give an overview of this first round. Uh, by the way, there's a second round coming. Um, there, there, there is a focus on voluntarism, by B. Maria. Um, uh, there has to be gender sensitivity. Um, we are looking at poverty on a multi-dimensional uh, viewpoint, and training is necessary to get out of poverty. Uh, there is a need for comprehensive reform. Uh, from the terms of the solution projects, uh, it is bottom up. It is not top down, um, and Alizan, you you mentioned very very succinctly that uh, we utilize research in problem solving, and uh, the SDGs in our context is being used for local context and platform for partnership. Now we have a second round, and we are going to go in the opposite direction now. Um, these are in terms of the experiences, opportunities, and challenges uh, that the APPGM has uh, experienced over the first pilot phase of 2020. Uh, what are the challenges face, the opportunities, uh, especially in view of the COVID-19 context, Alexander? Okay, thank you, Anthony. Um, I can think of a lot of challenges, but I'll, I'll, uh, but of course there's opportunities as well, uh, and, and there's a reason for that. In terms of APPG, I think um, we all have to also understand the APPG. Um, this is the second year of the APPG MSDG. 2020 was the first year, and we are still learning. I have to say that we are still learning. We are still evolving, and there are various uh, challenges that face our work in terms of APPG. I'll perhaps give it more in terms of. Um, again, my view as a researcher, um, but also some, some general views as well. 
Uh, okay, firstly, as a researcher, of course, the, the main thing you have to ensure is credibility uh, when you undertake the, the, your research. And this is very important because the APPG, as mentioned by Dr. Lin, our first activity is to map out issues at the local level. Um, now, it, it's not that simple to map out issues at the local level. As an experiment, APPG is quite interesting. I think this is one of the first times or first models being adopted throughout the whole world, especially related to SDGs, where we interface strongly with politicians, with members of parliament. And, and, and you know, YB is something you've given great uh, um, uh, collab contribution as well. But from the research point of view, you know, there can be a perception that this has been politicized, etc. So we really need to, to balance uh, the, 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 you know, the interface with politics and research, and, 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 uh, and we, 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 we did that by really having this methodology, which is bottom-up. You know, our issue mapping is really based on the views of the local stakeholders, local leaders, etc. Um, also, in terms of credibility, I think uh, it's also very, very challenging to, to really map the issues when we talk about, you know, what are the issues that are occurring on the ground? Um, you know, local stakeholders, um, you know, we, we cannot go to the local area and say, which SDG is the most important to you? Because most likely, there's lack of awareness on what SDGs is. So really, the process is, is we're still discovering many things and, and, and methodologies to, to really get, to really understand from the local point of view, what are the key issues um, on the ground? Um, secondly, uh, in terms of, again, working at the local level, I think what is really key is trust building. Now, we have a limited budget, we have a limited timeline. Um, we have to go to ground and usually we do a three-day program on trying to gather as much as information as possible, meeting the local leaders, etc. Now, we had a few situations, and Anthony will know this as well, where the local leaders tell me, what can you guarantee uh, that I will receive after your visit. And this is very important for them. It's this development, for, it's very personal, it's very crucial. So in that sense, it's, it's very challenging because we cannot guarantee anything uh, per se. Another challenge, of course, is in terms of data. I don't, I don't think I need to elaborate much more, especially at the local level. We really uh, lack a lot of data. So speak a bit more about, on opportunities. I think, first of all, as I mentioned in my first intervention, one of the key things of this SDGs, if, if not, you know, even if we don't attain all the SDGs by 2030, is really its capability or potential to bring different stakeholders together. And this is what the APPGM SDG has done. We work with parliamentarians, academics, local stakeholders, um, and civil society, uh, and so on. So I think, the, the challenge there is that at the moment is still on a yearly basis, is still ad hoc. Now, whether we do it through APPG or, or through other means, what the APPG really showed is the potential of a bottom-up process, essentially, that is multi-stakeholder. Now, this has to be institutionalized moving forward. If not, it will always be a kind of staggered approach, ad hoc, and, and as mentioned by YB William, a piecemeal approach. So really, if you want to um, further uh, evolve in this, it needs to be institutionalized. Secondly, in terms of opportunities more generally, I think those who were lucky, um, like me, to, to have visited some of the locations, it always strikes us of the potential that we have in the local areas. There is so much potential there. For example, I'll just give one example, and there, there's many examples uh, in Shawa where we have very interesting fresh produce um, that, that is unique to the area, but there is nowhere to market them. And of course, uh, many of the uh, residents there live in poverty. So that there is a lot of potential that is untapped that will also help the national economy as well if we really, really tap the potential that resides uh, across the country. So I think, again, just to sum up there, a bottom-up approach and a more decentralized approach should be, um, should be, I'm not saying it, that should be definitely the model way forward, but we should really explore that more moving forward. Thank you, Anthony. Sorry. Thank you, Aliza. Um, we come to Dr. Lin again. Uh, the APPGM uh, has approved 34 solution projects you mentioned earlier. Uh, what lessons um, are there for us in localizing SDGs? 
Thank you, Anthony. I think after the uh, identification and uh, prioritization of the uh, issues, uh, we will seek to design solution projects to address the issues that have been prioritized. And uh, during our first year of experiment, I mean, the uh, reaction, the uh, process is very mixed in all the constituencies. In some constituencies, we do have local expertise, local uh, organizations who are able to propose solutions and implement them. In others, there is a real uh, shortage of such expertise and knowledge but we really would like to have people with the local expertise and, and the knowledge of the local community so that they will be able to uh, propose something that is suitable for the community. So we really have quite a mixed bag among all the constituencies and uh, uh, some are, are quite, uh, some could be done better and some are done very well. So it's, it is quite, a mixed bag. And of course, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic really threw uh, Spana in the works. And uh, we had to stop uh, physical meeting. A lot of work is done through Zoom. And many of the community work cannot be done because of uh, MCO. And also some of the projects have to redesign to become more kind of income generating because a lot of the uh, communities are out of work and they lack income. So there were some modifications which had to be made and um, many are delayed. In fact, up to now, the 2020 projects uh, that are completed is only seven and the other 27 projects are still under implementation and we hope that they can be completed uh, by next month. So, and, uh, but then again, the uh, quality of uh, solution providers are very varied. And uh, the seven projects that are implemented are all in uh, YB Williams constituency. And so that's, and uh, of course, uh, in PJ, uh, YB Maria's constituency is also very advanced. But in some others, uh, they are quite far behind because of COVID and because of capacity of the service providers. So these are very big challenges. But for the, uh, on the plus side, you know, we are given a free hand to design from scratch whatever is needed by the community. Because so far, they have been relying only on government service delivery but they do, they do not seem to be working. For example, in the poor communities, flat dwellers, squatter communities, some of them are not even aware of social welfare benefits or where to apply for them. So what we have gone down is really to do needs assessment. We uh, inform them, we, we give coaching, we tell them how to improve their health, their well-being, and uh, get access to services and designing of these projects are really so relevant to them in their lives. So they are the communities that we work with are really happy to have us there and we learn from each other as to what would be more effective and uh, going forward in uh, 2021 we have a chance to improve performance in the new 20 constituencies as well as to uh, go into a phase two for the 10 constituencies. So I think it's a fantastic opportunity to do this uh, ground up approach. And also we uh, work not only just with the communities but also with government agencies to provide feedback, to collaborate with them, to improve services and and also the um, Alizan's outfit will also be continuing with the research, writing up recommendation papers and plans for the uh, YBs to present in parliament and also for us to present to the central agencies for any change in policy or programs.
Thank you, Dr. Lin. Uh, now we are coming back to the YBs, and I want I like to change the YB from young berhormat to young berhikmat. Um, YB William, uh, the Selayang Parliamentary, yeah, you got a very good tea up from from Dr. Lin. Uh. Um, now, please share some of your experiences in the Selayang Parliamentary constituency, uh, which is a semi-urban location, and the impact of the social economic conditions of the B40 caused by COVID-19. Thank you, Anthony. We had 10 projects, and we have three objectives when we designed the project and we discussed, and sometimes the discussions were quite honest and brutal, but finally we got it through. First, we wanted to make sure that to the participants, the SDGs are real and meaningful and not just slogans. Second, we needed the participation of the local NGOs, that they are empowered and they have a say in the project, that they know the community and they know the community problems and as opposed to a top-down approach as to what the organizers want. Thirdly and most importantly, that at the end of the project, both the participants and the local NGOs and myself as the MP can see that there are concrete evidence, concrete benefits and dividends to all that took part. And I'm happy to report that the projects that we have done, we are able to achieve this. Because Anthony is limiting me to four minutes, I can only tell you about three projects. As everyone would know, when you think of Selayang, it is the Selayang wholesale market. And when you think of that, you, you think of the Bangladeshi, the Yanmaris, the Rohingyas, refugees. So there have always been a tension between the foreigners and the local. But it became worse when there was a lockdown during the COVID and the locals felt that this was because the foreigners did not follow the SNP, the SOP, as a result of which the entire area were locked down. So there were high tensions. But it also exposed the problem that officially the refugees were invisible. They are off the radar. So when there was a lockdown, the authorities came and said, don't worry, we are going to provide food. There are 22,000 people in this area. The estimate was maybe about 6,000 uh, foreigners. But it turned out to be wrong. There were 16,000 foreigners. So the first few days was chaos because there was not enough food to go around and we have to scramble to provide food for everyone. But the tension came from there. So one of the projects that we did is how to live together, a social in inclusiveness, a social cohesion, living in harmony. And uh, that was our first project to teach the both our locals and the refugees, the foreigners, how are we going to live together? And more importantly, was we found out that the foreigners couldn't speak our language. They cannot speak Malay. They cannot express themselves. They were not able to tell what is it that they need. And what we had was we had gathered a group of the foreign ladies who have never spoke a word of Bahasa and within the course, we were able to teach them and at the end of the course, they were able to communicate with us in Bahasa Malaysia. I, I think that was a tremendous uh, achievement for those who were teaching and those who were learning finally can communicate and understand the difference in the culture. The second project that we are looking and very happy to, to report is the cafe operations and entrepreneurship. Single mothers were chosen to be, and they were taught to bake, 
confectionery, how to run a business, the entrepreneur side, customer service, pricing, strategy, and it's very happy to, to hear that they have had business before and they failed. And when we gave them the course, they came back and said, now I know why what went wrong. And uh, they were very happy to find the solution. So what we realized was that if you provide the top quality causes and you don't dumb down and you give them the quality that is appreciated, this is real life teaching that they can understand and appreciate. They have had business experience, but they were not able to have the knowledge and now they do. And we also have, we also taught them uh, digital marketing. And I'm so happy to hear when I go back and speak to them, that they are now baking cookies and they are selling it through the internet. So this is the COVID experience and they have gone into the new normal. Uh, they have proceeded and they are now making a living based on that few days, the course that we have given to them. The third project was for the youth that were in danger, the young and the younger group, that they may be enticed to join gangsterism and all the other bad things. So there was a course to teach them electricity and air conditioning. And at the end of the course, they reported back to us they were able to find jobs. They became employed in air conditioning companies and electrical companies. And there were a few who were able to get jobs themselves as a contractor. So these are real benefits, real tangible benefits. And both those who were imparting the knowledge who were giving the course, we feel that it was fulfilled, that we were able to hit the target and of course, those who took part, participated, really enjoyed tangible benefits. So overall, the experience was good for all involved. And this is a situation where when the project was discussed with the local NGOs who knew the community problems, and we were able to design a project where the community really needed it. And when we, at the end of the day, when we get the feedback, I think the answer to all everyone's question was that this is a good project and everyone wants this to be continued. So I will be asking Anthony to give us more money for Slayang for the next session. Thank you. Actually, I have my passport with me. Um, we come now to uh, YB Maria Chin. Um, uh, YB Maria, uh, please share some of your experiences of localizing SDGs in Petaling Jaya Parliamentary constituency, especially in addressing concerns of flat dwellers in Desa Mentari and Leba Subang areas. YB. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think that uh, when we actually embark on the um, APPGM pro uh, solution projects, we actually uh, thought that um, if we go, we target two housing um, areas. One is in Lemba Subang, uh, one, and the other one you know, is actually at Desa Mentari. The, the perception of uh, Petaling Jaya is that it's uh, well and good, but actually within it, we have urban poverty. And it is all in the concrete jungles that have been built by um, the government, uh, hiding some of the poor uh, B40s in this uh, housing. Because when um, these uh, flats, low cost flats, or even the public housing were built, they were only built as structures. They never thought of the social, environmental uh, need of the people. So therefore, um, there is no sense of ownership in terms of the uh, housing. 
and um, and so therefore you have a lot of problems from rubbish to abandoned cars to uh, dra clock drains to um, you know water leaking all the time and you don't know whether it's coming from the sewage or actually from the household uh, water pipes um, so when we actually embark on it, we actually look at the uh, SGG um, approach where it says uh, bottom up. Yeah, what does that really mean? Uh, so we wanted to actually uh, capture the uh, voices of the community so that they can actually not just identify the issues but also to find a solutions and to break this whole dependency that only with money i can resolve the problem and only the uh, ahli parliament or the government or the adun uh, with their money can solve my problem so we want to break that kind of uh, dependency and um, empower them so we actually took on this uh, approach called the cultural mapping this was actually done in penang where they uh, try to uh, gender mainstream uh, uh, budgeting in, um, and involve the community into that whole process. So we brought uh, Janet Pillay over to do the cultural mapping where we sat with the communities in coffee shop, in the garai garai. Uh, when we find them along the street, we ask them uh, to cultural map uh, is meant to actually identify what is the key issue in their housing area. And we thought that initially they will tell us about the rubbish, about the uh, abandoned cars and so forth. But no, we actually were, um, were very surprised that they shared the kind of poverty that they are facing, particularly when it came to uh, MCO and particularly to female headed household. Because most of the women were actually doing jobs that re um, that actually need physical presence and not online. They were the cleaners. Their husbands were actually the drivers, the taxi uh, drivers, the lorry drivers. Um, so when the MCO came, they couldn't uh, do any work. They couldn't drive the taxi for a long time. They couldn't drive the lorry. They can't even rent us the nagri. So um, the poverty was really very real to them. Even though they were earning an income of 3,000, usually they would be able to survive, but they couldn't. And um, it came to a point where some of them could not even have enough food for a week. So, uh, so when we did the cultural mapping, we asked them for solutions and they gave us uh, answers to it. So that was uh, pretty good because um, that actually gave them the sense that we don't really have to wait for the Adli Parliament or the MPBJ to come and help us remove our rubbish or to get the food. We can actually uh, approach a Food Foundation or some of the other NGOs to actually get help. So that was one of our projects. The other project was actually because uh, the MCO re um, prevented a lot of the children from going to schools. So I was actually trying to get um, the Ministry of uh, Housing and Local Government to open up some of the uh, day one, yeah, to allow it to be turned into learning centers, but um, that was rejected. So eventually we had to do uh, a lot of online uh, tuition. So a group of uh, informal NGOs who were actually giving tuitions, which actually include Sunway um, University, it included uh, Taylor's, uh, Yayasan Gamilan and all that. They formed an informal group and um, decided to share resources decided to share the, the syllabus that they have been teaching the, the kids uh, and to actually provide better tuition. And uh, also, they actually explore with this whole concept of social cohesion. Because uh, even though you are living in flats, you are supposed to be able to know your neighbours. But in Lempa Subang and Desa Mantari, it is very uh, isolated. They don't even know their neighbours. They don't really care because in their mind is I have to put food on the table, I have to go out to work and I have to take care of my children. So they don't really know what is happening to their neighbours and through the 
um, through this informal network, they introduced this whole concept of uh, social inclusiveness, uh, helping uh, your friends uh, who are part of the tuition classes. Um, and they started, um, the children started reporting back to the teachers. Uh, some, some of the families cannot, um, couldn't buy food for that day. And so the, the children were actually hungry for the past two days. So we got to know that and we were able to actually bring food to the families. Um, the other one uh, is that um, what came out very important was that we, in all these housing uh, areas, yeah, the low cost flats particularly, uh, they really need to look at not just having kindergartens, but also a learning center where children can actually um, have space to do their homework. Because the unit is so small that, um, and you are crowded. You are crowded because you have the fam, uh, your father, mother, maybe three to four children, and your mother-in-law, your grandparents are also staying in that same unit. And so there's no space for the children to do their homework, no quietness. And, there's, um, and, and so therefore, when we actually finally opened up one of the cabin, uh, a lot of them actually came because um, they felt there was a space for them to actually do their homework and, um, and actually have internet access because a lot of the e-learning was online. So these are the kind of challenges that where, while we have national policies on learning, uh, and the government says that, you know, um, they will try to reach out to all the students. Um, some have actually fallen off the crack, uh, into the crack. The other project is actually, um, after knowing all this uh, problem, we felt that the agencies and the communities need to connect. So we actually had this interagency um, dialogue. First, we gather the uh, community to actually identify what are the issues you want to bring to the, um, to the MPPJ, to uh, state government, and even to the federal government. And uh, we were actually in the process of uh, talking to the community for them to map out their issues and how they feel um, are the priorities of the issues that they want the authorities to look into. So we are, in the, we are still in the process of doing that. Uh, and uh, we hope that you know, this interagency collaboration and discussion, yeah, engagement, uh, is something very uh, new to the communities particularly. Uh, some were actually having uh, a lot of reservations because in their mind, they won't, they won't help us anyway. No matter how many times we tell them the problems, it doesn't get solved. But we were trying to uh, convince them that we, we just need to keep trying and, uh, and understand also that the government agencies also have their problems. So together, we may be able to solve uh, some of the issues. So uh, I, I think that the APBGM uh, program actually uh, brought in this whole idea that even with very small resources, we can actually make impactful uh, changes. Uh, it may not change their life totally, but at least we bring in some concept of uh, self-worth, yeah? uh, the self-respect, and being able to take control of your life and uh, make the changes without too much of uh, handouts. Thank you. Uh, thank you, YB Marichin. Um, uh, something actually popped up from this conversation in round two, and it is the importance of SDG 17. Uh, I think earlier there was, there was actually a mention that uh, SDG 17 seems to be put right at the back. But if you don't have partnerships towards achieving the goals, how do you achieve SDG 1 to 16? So, um, uh, Alizan, you mentioned about credibility of research, building trust, uh, bringing stakeholders together, and to have an institutional approach. Dr. Lin, you spoke about uh, solution projects to address the prioritized challenge, challenges and the shortage of local experts, which means you need to communicate with people outside the community. Uh, YB William, you mentioned about 
participation of local NGOs, concrete benefits to all that took part, and uh, foreigners' communication in Bahasa Malaysia, uh, the job creation that came out of the uh, aircon repair. And finally, YB Area, you mentioned about urban poverty, social environmental needs that are neglected, uh, the cultural mapping of key issues, uh, work needing physical presence that doesn't allow people to work online. And uh, uh, one thing that was interesting was the informal group that was created or came together, I would say, that shared resources to provide better tuition and social uh, cohesion. And of course, you, you ended up with the inter-agency inter dialogue. Now, um, yeah, I, I, I just like to emphasize the importance of SDG 17, that partnerships are a prerequisite. Um, the SDGs cannot be achieved alone. Yeah. So um, I'd like to open up for questions from the floor. Notice the long pause. I know some of you are waiting for the session to finish so that you can run to your cars. <laughs> because I don't know, but I don't know whether it's raining outside or there's a heavy jam. So, anyone with questions? Going once, going twice, sold. Can we, can we have a round of applause to our speakers? Thank you very much.